from across the globe, from the center of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading the Aero Society podcast from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Tonight, uh, Christian Wicker is going to talk to us about Lufthansa Technic, in specifically about landing gear overhaul. Exactly. Uh, Christian joined Lufthansa Technic in April 2005. Mm -hmm. I guess you provided this to us, so you'll know exactly what's written here. <laughs> Um, he completed his studies at the Ulm University, mm. great cathedral, I love, yes. the, I love the spire. The, the tallest one of in my the world, favorite you know. Places. Mm. Yeah, one of my favorite mm. places, walking up the spire. Mm. Um, <clears throat> from, from university he joined um, Lufthansa Technik, looking after key customer accounts in Hamburg, after which he went to work in Fort Lauderdale. That was quite nice. Very nice indeed. <laughs> From Fort Lauderdale back to Hamburg, where he did lots of jobs, including um, AOG desk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, currently, he's the head of sales and marketing for the landing gear division of uh, Lufthansa Technic. And since February, he's been based in the UK. I don't want to say any more. Enjoy the evening. Over to you, Christian. Thank you very much. Very kind. And um, yeah, welcome from my side as well. Welcome. And, um, yeah, uh, nice to see all of you tonight. Um, first of all, I have to apologize for my voice, as you may, uh, may have uh, heard already before. Um, I'm uh, having a bit of a sore throat tonight, but I hope it doesn't disturb all, uh, too much. Um, and uh, I, I think the, uh, all will go well with that. Um, I think um, I've been asked a couple of months ago uh, if uh, I could do a presentation maybe tonight about um, basically what we're doing here in landing gear and um, this being uh, also um, my profession for three years actually, so that's um, three years I'm based in the UK. Um, that's uh, why I've today brought a bit of um, the company uh, Lufthansa Technik but as well uh, some um, outlook on uh, what we're doing for uh, landing gear overhauls, as well as maybe f um, from some of the market environments we are acting in. Um, I've heard some comments on our livery today already, or the changed livery of Lufthansa, so that's why I purposely did bring a picture from the back. As you may see that, um, I hope you like that one. It's one of my favorite marketing pictures, um, very bright, very sunny. We may uh, need that in December. Um, and please, um, if there are any questions in the meantime, um, please feel free to ask them. Um, we have a bit of time after that uh, lecture as well, but uh, if you have any, anything in between, let me know. Um, that's a bit of the agenda tonight. Um, we'll be having a short introduction into the company. As some of uh, us may know that company already, so yeah, some colleagues here tonight as well. Um, then I'll focus a bit on um, the landing gear um, specifics and as well I'd like to give you a bit of an outlook on what's happening currently in the market because I'm a bit sales driven so I hope that won't bore you too much as engineers but um, maybe a different view on the things there. So introduction starts um, with Lufthansa as a group. Um, as you are probably aware we are fighting with Ryanair every year a bit about who's having the most passengers. Um, the figures you're seeing here, 130 million, um, are from the past year, 2017, and this have, has been the group-wide figures of passengers, and we just surpassed Ryanair by a couple. Um, so <laughs> we're quite happy to be in number one again. But I think this year it might have changed again, so I don't have the numbers of 2018. Um, overall, the company is quite um, big, so a lot of opportunities also. If you would uh, be interested in, an, in a, a job or if you're um, finishing your studies, um, let me know. We, I think we have uh, quite nice opportunities in the group. Um, corporate headquarters is actually not Frankfurt, as um, many people would believe. Um, Frankfurt is just a major hub, a hub but a corporate headquarters for some reason is Cologne. Um, Overall, we have um, 130,000 people working for us in the group, so uh, quite a few. Please uh, uh, don't expect it, I know all of them, but um, there are quite, quite many. And um, the hubs, uh, I mean, they're probably known to you anyhow 
Frankfurt, Munich, Zurich, Vienna and Brussels. Overall, the business is organized in four business segments and I'll show you in the next slide what kind of four business segments we do have. Um, unfortunately, this slide already shows five, so um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Obviously, the large, uh, largest one and also in terms of revenue and employees is um, flying aircraft around and um, having um, people um, move from left to right. Um, so um, this is obviously the core of our business, the airline group. Um, on top of that, we do have also the logistics group um, having um, mainly uh, transportation um, of cargo um, in its core business. Um, and tonight you're going to listen um, a bit to what we are providing as a um, maintenance organization to the world. Um, and quite important, I think, for all of us, if we're flying long haul at least, um, we also uh, find it quite important to have good food on the plane. So that's why uh, you see that as well. Yeah, and um, not all f was fitting into these four categories. So we have another, other activities where you do have, for example, training or you have the credit cards and the bonus programs and miles programs and all that in there. This is a picture from the base in Hamburg. I'm not sure if anybody has been there. Um, it's quite a large base. There's a bus shuttle running every 10 minutes um, just on the base. So um, you see a few hangars here, roughly um, six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 people working there. Um, and um, major headquarters for our uh, Lufthansa Technik um, organization. So um, this is where basically our boss sits and uh, expects us to report the revenues and profits every, every month. Um, the group itself consists um, also out of uh, 21,000 employees, um, so quite, quite um, big in terms of um, employees. Um, and we do cater for um, 800 airlines, or we look after 800 airline customers. So if you um, speak to any um, of uh, people around here in BA, for example, they're one of our airline customers. Um, I'll show you in a minute a bit more about that, but many, many more as well. And overall, we um, have um, come up with a figure of almost um, or a bit more than four and a half thousand aircraft we, we look after. Um, revenue of uh, 5.4 billion, so yeah, oh, I, I always um, find it hard to imagine what kind of figure that is, but just um, to give you that as well. And um, the whole group is organized with 36 subsidiaries um, all around the world. Um, what we actually believe we provide to our customers is a, a one-stop solution. Um, so whenever you have an idea of what you need for your, for your aircraft in terms of maintenance, repair, overall, you, we will probably have the solution for that. Um, we have um, several businesses looking into that and um, this is um, basically also how the company is organized. These five um, segments or these five divisions um, are the, um, yeah, the pillars of the company, starting with aircraft um, services on the very far left, where we do have um, the organization looking after the base maintenance, line maintenance and uh, overhauls. Engine services, I think this stands for itself. Um, component services, everything which you can plug uh, off an aircraft basically. Um, and um, landing gear, which we're going to listen to tonight, but as well, and this is something which I find also particularly interesting, the VIP division. And usually I think not many of us are um, very close to that, so I have a video if you're interested in that to show you an insight um, of an aircraft, which is um, something uh, we just did in uh, Hamburg. So I um, hope this will come out right. Yeah.
So you are a bit different than the usual air travel I'm usually taking. Um, it's uh, quite impressive and also the cost to that are quite impressive. Obviously customers are usually not disclosed um, and um, in particular um, very shy as well. So that's also why as we as the employees of, um, of Lufthansa Technik uh, cannot just simply go there and visit the living room of this guy. Um, so you have to have a certain sticker on your badge to really actually enter the aircraft or in the hangar. Um, but quite nice to see that and um, it's one of the divisions which we also look after and uh, sometimes they're also doing the landing gears with us. Um, overall, if you see these um, products, we do bundle them as well. This is um, just maybe to briefly introduce you also the different structures of products, how they can look like. Um, you could just simply come and say, hey, I like to have, um, I don't know, uh, a certain part of an aircraft, a certain engine overhaul. Well, you could do this, but this is obviously also quite costly because you just come with one aircraft or one landing gear, one engine. So what we do is actually we um, bundle them and we buy, um, or we have um, potential also to buy better services um, from our subcontractors if we have a certain volume. Um, and these are usually also done by the power by the hour contract. So you have an engine which you just pay by the hour, and then if it's coming off the aircraft, it's actually already covered. So these are the ideas. Um, how to actually get customers a better cost structure. We also have, um, as I said, already many um, entities around the world. This is a picture from, the, from Manila, from um, the base maintenance organization in the Philippines. Um, the idea is really to have um, an organization, and this is um, somehow also um, coming more and more, becoming more and more our DNA, an organization which is close to our customers. So we have obviously a landing gear shop here in the UK, but we also have one in um, LA and uh, we have one in Hamburg. We still don't have one in Asia, I have to admit, but um, let's say we're working on that. This is obviously enhancing the availability towards our customers. So whenever you require a service, you are in the, in the local region and um, it's giving some flexibility and some efficiency as well to, um, yeah, to perform the service as and when they are needed. Um, so looking into the landing gear section, and um, this is what I have brought here, we do have um, four sites which we, um, which we call um, belonging to our network of landing gear sites. Um, starting maybe with the one very close to us, um, which is in Hayes, uh, just 10 minutes away from here. Um, and it used to be um, the ex-British Airways landing gear shop. Um, it used to be a TBA, uh, was built new, and I'll have a picture of that building in a minute as well. Um, it was built new in 99 and then sold on to a company which is called Hawker Pacific, uh, which eventually was um, bought by Lufthansa Technik in 2001, I believe. Um, so in London, we do um, many different types of landing gear, but we focus pretty much on one, which is the Boeing aircraft landing gear type. Um, and um, we have um, currently a majority of our customers on the 777 as well as on the 737 NG side. Um, Basically, 80% of our business, I would say, would, would come from those two aircraft types. Um, on top, we are gearing up for uh, something like 787 as well. Quite interesting. I have uh, some more info later. And as well, we have um, an idea that, we, well, we are marketing this already, that we want to do A380 as well. Um, all of them, and this is um, something which um, might surprise you now, are uh, from one OEM. Uh, the OEM is a Goodrich or Uters, and that's also where we said we bundle them in London. On the other hand, um, we have um, capacity in Hamburg, um, another landing shop about the same size, um, where we do basically all landing gears which come from Safran, um, and therefore mainly Airbus landing gear. Um, the A320s are um, obviously uh, focused there as well as A330s. A little bit different in the US, um, we do have a mixture of different aircraft uh, landing gears which we can do there. Um, for example, um, as you can see, already quite, let's say, legacy aircraft or quite um, old aircraft, A300, A310. But this is also the reason that many of them are still flying in the Americas. If you look into FedEx, for example, one of our major customers there, they still operate many A310 and um, we, we do serve uh, their landing gear still. You wouldn't find that in Europe. Um, yeah, overall, these three sites do belong 100% to the group. And we have um, in each side roughly 300 lakhs capacity a year. So basically, if you imagine one landing gear a day, moving in, moving out of the building, 
this is what we kind of uh, achieve currently in this group. Um, on the very far right, I did say earlier we don't have a site in Asia, but um, I, um, we have one, uh, let's say, group partner there, which is um, belonging to a joint venture, which Lufthansa does have with Air China. Um, and this is um, Ameco Beijing. It's the maintenance organization of Air China, quite um, powerful, quite massive um, now since they joined um, all their organization into one group. And Lufthansa does have an ownership of 25% in that company as well. And they have also a lending shop, um, which, do, which roughly does 100 lakhs a year. Um, so these basically are the sites uh, if, when it comes to lending gear. We still think that Asia is a little bit of a, um, yeah, we need some improvements there. Um, but uh, this is strategic about to come, I think, at one point. About competence, we are um, not just overhauling uh, things. And this is quite um, interesting for um, our customers because we can next to um, the maintenance organization which we are, their part 145 um, approval which we have. Um, we have um, also design and production approval for parts. So what we could do if a customer accepts this and agrees with us, um, produce parts and um, really replace them um, and uh, don't use the OEM parts. Obviously many customers are cautious about that, in particular since um, those are leased aircraft. So if you don't own an aircraft, you need to be very careful what kind of maintenance you do. Um, and this is something which um, we are currently working on quite heavily. So within the group we organize um, uh, next steps of developments to actually um, deploy more and more parts which we develop or repairs which we develop into landing gears. So in one idea, I mean this is, it sounds maybe stupid, but um, a structural part, um, maybe like a cylinder of a landing gear, something which currently under the past 60 years always was sold or manufactured by the OEM. Why can't we re-engineer this and do this also on our own? I think the capacity and capability is there. Um, it's just a matter of um, yeah, getting there and doing it in, in the right way. Um, innovation is quite crucial right now in the industry. Um, we do see a lot of things changing. Um, and what we see obviously being the front runner on certain things does help to capture a bit of the market environment, but also develop the necess necessary size of uh, the business. Now, if you're coming too late, um, you might have the chance um, that you get a bit of the business still, but um, being in the front of the, um, of the queue is actually helping here um, to have the certain size to negotiate um, good deals with customers, but as well with um, suppliers. So that's, that's why, uh, for example, if you look at the A350 on the right, um, we decided very early on that this will be a key, um, key model to invest into. Uh, and investing doesn't mean then we need to buy engines, we need to buy um, components of several hundred millions. Um, we have to have lending gears for our customers. All these things basically um, does come with a lot of, um, let's say, dollars um, in, in, uh, in the end of the day. Um, yeah, basically all these um, innovations, and I have a few examples here, will obviously um, either help quality, so we have better um, improved quality, or will uh, keep the cost down. A very um, interesting example, um, dry ice cleaning, the very um, top left you see there. Um, engines um, tend to um, have a bit of residue from, um, from the kerosene. So we have invented something quite, um, quite new that with dry ice you can actually clean them and you're going to save a bit of fuel. Um, it's not, not, uh, not hard to do this. Can you do this during a night check, for example, and um, therefore still save um, a bit of uh, fuel, which is quite expensive. Another interesting um, uh, repair, basically, or not repair, but an improvement um, on this side, um, aerodynamic improvements. This means actually a shark skin. Um, which is developed um, to um, improve airflow on, this, on, the, on the skin of the aircraft. Um, so this is something which is then also investing into an, um, a technology which helps the customer, which helps an airline um, to save fuel. This is now coming um, up in my presentation as well later. Um, predictive maintenance is um, a quite interesting field to, uh, to look into as well. So what kind of maintenance you can do early enough to avoid an AOG situation, which is always very expensive for an airline. 
and what kind of um, maintenance you can even maybe postpone to a later stage because you're doing it too early. There's an example um, that we can with um, the data collection which is available today um, save a lot of money out of that. Uh, either avoiding this AOG which is not pl uh, planned, which is costing you a lot of money, putting um, people in hotels, paying for their food and all that, um, booking another aircraft um, to carry them and as well, um, yes, still um, doing the right decision um, to maintain your aircraft. And that's why um, actually we believe, and you may have seen there was a press um, information earlier this week from our CEO, that we believe that big data or data analysis is currently crucial. Um, this is a recent development from the past year that um, we um, put out in the market it's called Aviatar, which is um, basically an open source platform. You can actually bring in everybody um, to develop um, tools or apps or solutions on this platform um, to fix things on an aircraft. The aircraft is delivering all these data sets already. Um, so an A320, for example, does have, um, if I'm not mistaken now, um, about 7,000 data sets um, during a flight. And you actually don't use them today. Yeah? There are many, many hidden. Um, and you don't have the technology to um, bring them to life. So we try to capture them, but it's also not that easy because um, the OEMs and the manufacturers want to keep these data, obviously. Uh, if you have the data, you can decide what you do with your aircraft, with your maintenance. So this is why we believe the next month and years, data will become the crucial, um, the crucial next step, um, and we have to have access to that. Um, as industry and not just leave it to the OEMs to um, gather them and have, um, yeah, have basically uh, free usage of that. If you like, um, you can just um, type it in online, search for Aviatar. There's even an online game um, it's called Hangar Heroes. Um, quite funny. Uh, you can play a bit with the capability there. Um, last but not least on the um, introduction side, um, we also believe being a European company and um, having this in our DNA as well, um, we want to be a green MRO as well. This is um, somehow maybe quite easy to, um, let's say, pollute your, pollute your environment and maybe do a bit of waste uh, here and there, um, but this is not um, how our uh, code of conduct and how, do, how we do work. So um, next to um, obviously recycling and um, having um, some, uh, yeah, projects actually reducing greenhouse gas emission, um, we believe this is quite important also. Minor things like um, in haze, we do recycle, for example, also material. Obviously, um, we sell it back to the, um, uh, to the, to the plant where we got it from. Um, basically, quite simple things, but you actually have to do them. Um, I promised you to bring up a few information about our customers as well. Obviously, not all of them, but just to give you a broad picture on whom we are working with. Um, and you sort of, uh, might, might be surprised that, I mean, we do have Lufthansa in our name. Yeah, sure. We are a part of that group, but um, this is minor business for us. Um, I think the whole business uh, we're doing with Lufthansa is in the range of 25% of our revenue. So 75% is coming out of the um, industry. Um, and that's also why we think it's quite important um, to react not just to let's say our shareholder, but to react to what's happening in the market. And um, yeah, very proud obviously as well to have um, a few UK um, customers in there as well. You may see um, British Airways, but as well EasyJet, Virgin Atlantic, um, and um, Thomas Cook, um, Jet2Com, um, all being um, customers of us as well. So we believe uh, in the UK as um, as uh, aviation market is quite important for us, and that's also why we have um, just around the corner uh, yeah, roughly uh, 310 people sitting doing the landing gear overhauls here in the UK. Actually, I have to just say, usually I'm in this building um, to meet a customer as well, but it's not that pleasant because usually they want money from me, so it's a bit better tonight. <laughs> not sure if this is too blurry or not, but you may see this is actually London. Um, Photograph. I don't know how, yeah, but photographed from a belly of an aircraft with a landing gear. Um, I believe it's a 320. Um, it's uh, quite a nice picture. I like very much because it's representing um, 
our uh, footprint here in London, but as well the business we are doing. And it's not uh, uh, Photoshop, so um, I, uh, I don't know how they did it, but uh, must be a GoPro next to, I don't know, uh, the landing gear door. <laughs> now coming a bit more specific to um, the landing gear process um, and how do we do, how do, we do um, um, a landing gear overhaul. And um, in this, we have um, yeah, a few um, steps which I would like to highlight to you today. Um, on top, I also have a video, which um, you, you might know very well, <laughs> but um, we have uh, made a video a couple of um, years ago, which is actually representing all steps of the landing overall. And obviously, it would have been very nice of all of you just to come to our facility in Hayes tonight. So I could have give you a shop tour and you could have touched and seen a few things. Well, we can't do this, but um, at least we have a bit of a video, which is uh, hopefully substituting for that. So, um, yeah, the overall process simply starts with receiving a gear from the customer, which um, already um, does uh, yeah, require a lot of logistics, um, but I'll show you in a minute um, how we deal with logistics. So let's maybe focus on the overall process right now. Bring to this into the building, um, start tearing down the landing gear. All bits and pieces come off, which we then um, clean and identify. Um, paint strip um, is, is, is one of the next steps, um, inspection and uh, the first NDT, not destructive testing. Um, and then our repair loop or repair cycle actually starts. And this is um, basically um, happening maybe once, uh, twice or thrice even potentially until we have the right um, yeah, parts available to fit them again. Um, after that, bushing installation. Uh, it's going to be painted again, uh, obviously it needs to be shiny and bright. And um, then we actually build it up to one landing gear again, marshalling, uh, building, testing, uh, release to service, obviously we need to certify what we're doing, and then it's going back to logistics. So if you're interested, I'm going to then show you a bit of a video here. Um, and um, let me know if it's too fast, I can stop it always in the meantime, but uh, showing all different steps of the land here overall.
All right. Um, the only thing which I don't like about this video is just stating as good as new. I think it's at least as good as new. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, you might have seen that we just briefly with this video went through all these steps and um, have seen um, yeah, basically a, a continuation from getting a very dirty thing, uh, very, um, yeah, very neat of overhaul back into a very new, uh, nicely shaped landing gear. How would we do that? Basically, um, in this shop, yeah, well, like the footprint, um, I think we have about 13,000 um, 13, um, square meter, um, roughly. Um, it uh, was uh, still built during a time when BA was having um, ownership of that, um, of that uh, landing gear shop. Um, so it's the one of uh, the advantages that's purposely built for a landing gear overhaul. So we have a U-shaped pattern, which is actually um, quite nice for all parts to follow. So we start with inspection um, and um, always tear down inspection, paint strip, and then the rework loop is, is following. And then you actually build these all parts back into again, marshalling and build up basically before you ship with logistics. Um, I have um, mentioned already we focus on, we focus on um, the um, UTAS or Boeing part of the world um, and as well um, what we do have and this is something we are quite proud of um, we have also um, approvals from around the world to do certification according to our customers um, authority approval but one which is very outstanding is um, the Japanese approval um, you may know or may not know but uh, getting a, a Japanese um, authority approval to certify according to that is quite time consuming you need to have a sponsor and basically one of the highest recognized um, approvals in the world um, and apparently we have been told um, we would be the only shop um, landing gear shop outside of Japan having that approval so um, that's something which uh, we try to maintain but it's uh, still every year a lot of efforts uh, to do this and um, many uh, Japanese will come and visit you this is something which I can say already <laughs> but obviously we have also um, we have this for a reason because um, we do serve our customers in Japan um, as well, um, out of the UK. Um, for us, I mean, doing maintenance is also usually a philosophy thing, um, but for us the philosophy is to have um, full house, a full in-house capability of, um, of things you do. I mean, first of all, you can control your processes, you have cost control, you have also um, a full control of quality, which is quite important. Um, as you may have seen in the invite or on the, on the, um, on the brochure for the lecture, um, the landing gear is the only thing on an aircraft which is not redundant. If, you, if it breaks, um, you're going to have uh, a hell of trouble, yeah, because it's not like a computer which you have three times um, or an engine which you at least have two times as well. So the only thing which is not redundant, um, I think you have to look after quality quite in particular. Um, good thing is, which the design of the Boeing world is quite stable and quite solid. So we do have the chance to repair a lot. We can fix a lot of things. And um, this is basically a massive um, structure. It's a bit different in, on the Airbus side of, of, the, of the world, where you do have more delicate decisions to make. And um, they are usually on um, higher scrap rates as well, because uh, parts need to be replaced more often. They're not designed for their life. So yeah, this is, this is uh, obviously philosophy. We do also have, um, a, a, or we do cater for the lean philosophy. We just have had um, another round of 5S in our facility, um, which is always fun. And um, Gamba walks and all these things, which you may have uh, heard during your studies or uh, during your um, professional life, um, we apply as well. And we try to um, yeah, obviously keep and maintain our quality with that. In-house, we have um, a full-blown plating shop. Um, so um, this is also an env environmental issue, so we have to look after that as well. Um, so we have certain um, um, yeah, alarms, for example. We have a, a gas alarm as well, um, and not just the fire alarm. Um, and we do have also um, the pushing manufacturing in-house as well. We have a machine shop which is doing that. Um, and this is for us also one key thing to have um, a quick turnaround time and qu good quality as well as well on top of the cost structure we, we're using. Um, yeah, and next to um, the landing gear itself, I mean, you probably know there are quite a few parts connected to it. You have an actuation system, um, you have electrics. 
all these things we do have um, in-house in that same shop as well. Um, again, to keep the, show, the turnaround time short. So if you um, just would give a wild guess on how long it would take us to overhaul a 777. Any clue? And please don't say anything yet. Any, anything from, from anybody? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. So 777, very, very large, actually the largest landing gear in the world. Um, we do require 45 days to do a full overhaul. Um, this, is, um, this is somehow, um, yeah, currently um, very, um, very important for us because um, next to um, having capacity in the shop, we also invest into spare landing gears, which we rotate with our customers. And um, 777 spare landing gear um, of the newest model, the 300ER, for example, um, is um, a new price uh, around uh, $18 million. So um, you, have, um, you have quite significant investment, which you cannot just um, wait for uh, and, and have just sit around. Um, so I'll have a few more information on that as well, but um, just to mention that the 45 days is quite, quite important for us. Um, 737NG, we target currently 35 days, <clears throat> and um, this is the range of, um, of the landing gears we're in. Some are not that crucial. So if you look, for example, into 747-400, you have surplus uh, gears in the market, so you have plenty of time. You can uh, use that. Just quickly on the landing gear OEMs, I mentioned already we are focusing on the Utah side. Um, but next to that, we also have different other um, OEMs in the market. Maybe hard to read, but let me just help you with that. Airbus, I mentioned Safran, and, and we have Leapair for smaller aircraft as well. Quite interesting, um, on the legacy aircrafts, you only do see one OEM per aircraft. This is changing now. Um, on the right-hand side, you may see that. Um, the um, A380, for example, in particular, I'm not sure, yeah, that is. Um, the nose landing gear is coming from Safran, while the main landing gears, four of them, are coming from um, Utahs. Um, similar thing on the A350. And um, on a 777X, you even have a totally new manufacturer, a new AOEM, which never used to make these big landing gears at all. So this is um, changing our market environment, it's changing how uh, we act and what kind of supplier relationships we have. Um, but also, I'll uh, come to that in a minute. Um, one technical slide um, I had to copy in as well <laughs> to give you a bit of um, a drawing here. Um, I mentioned we are focusing on 787 and gearing up for that landing gear as well. We still have a bit of time. The first ones will only come in 2021, 22 maybe. Um, but um, this is actually um, just a bit of a, some details of how a landing gear of a new model is looking like. So we do have, um, first of all, three different types again available. It's not just the one landing gear. You have always different types. And um, you see that a lot of um, new types are coming with uh, titanium parts. So where you don't usually have, um, on the past you would have used a steel, ice frank steel. Um, now they're using titanium parts. Um, plus um, some other um, bush, uh, bushes as well. And um, on top, um, we have um, tungsten carbide cr uh, instead of chrome um, for, um, for the cylinders, which is um, uh, then again a, a new investment which is required um, if you overhaul a landing gear. This um, is basically the new technology used for that. It's actually a spray flay, which is um, 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 yeah, applied onto, um, onto the landing gear part. Um, and it's not quite sure yet if um, during a landing gear overhaul this needs to be redone or not, or if it's still good from 10 years before. Um, so we will, we will see this is coming um, probably in the next years with the A380, the first landing gear who's actually using this new technology. Um, but we feel we are quite equipped with that um, because we have already invested in our engine division um, into this technology and we're using that for 30 years already. So we hope that um, after all, even if it's required um, to, um, yeah, to apply um, on the landing gear parts again, we will be able to do this. And um, this is then again helping us to yeah, improve our turnaround times as well. Um, and this is 
basically um, a new investment, just roughly about um, a couple of millions again. Um, so landing gears are quite expensive things. Um, one example of a repair which was um, just developed for the F380. Um, this is an axle sleeve. Um, you find um, about 16 on them uh, on an aircraft of them on an aircraft. Um, and all over the place they have had cracks and chipping and corrosion and dents and damages. So they didn't last the 12 full years of um, the cycle. Yeah. So every couple of years you have to replace them. Um, buying this thing new um, is actually probably $30,000. So it's quite nice a car, I would say. Um, so we had developed a repair for that uh, with the technology I showed before. And uh, we are now actually offering this to the, um, to the airline world and to our customers. And they are quite, um, quite happy with that. So we have quite a good workload with um, our customers. Um, and just to give you also an estimate, the savings of each aircraft in that region is um, roughly between $300,000 um, of this uh, period. So just having this, let's say, minor part, if you want to say it like that, um, repaired rather than replaced, you save this amount of money. So that's why we believe it's quite important to have this role of an MRO and not just be the OEM. The OEM was quite happy selling new all the time, yeah. They've had no trouble with that. Um, but we had some trouble with buying them new. So, yeah, this is, um, and this is the, just one example where you have plenty and many and we are trying to develop more and more. Um, I mentioned logistics before and um, then you have seen or referred that this 777 is the largest lending gear uh, available in the market right now. Um, how do you move this from left to right and having a customer in Tokyo is, is not just around the corner and you can just put it, not just put it on a lorry and drive, uh, drive here. <laughs> so what um, we have developed are those metal crates um, which are um, quite, um, quite nice to fit one um, whole assembly of a landing gear in pieces already um, on a 777 onto this crate and then you air freight it, um, which is um, obviously still costly. Yeah. Um, so a round trip, um, let's say maybe to Dubai um, on that um, is $40,000. Um, but uh, it's still more um, efficient and more cost effective um, than having it, um, let's say, uh, either trucked if it's possible or um, have it on, an, on a sea uh, freight. This is, this is also another idea which we try to bring in to save the cost and, um, and uh, develop innovations. And then I did mention um, the investments which we have to do or which we are doing on um, spare landing gears. So obviously if a customer comes to me and asks, well, um, could you please help me out, um, quote, on an overhaul, and they usually do not, not only need the overhaul, but they also need a spare landing gear because the aircraft will not wait for 45 days um, to, have, um, to have the landing gear returned. Um, so what we do is provide them an exchange, which is uh, the usual way. Uh, landing gear, which needs to fit obviously certain criteria um, in cycles, back to birth history, so it's a lot of paperwork. Um, but this is then an addition to the overall services. Unfortunately, for that matter, we have to have a pool of landing gears, which is then um, yeah another in investment. And just to give you a few figures, I mentioned the 18 million already on the 777 landing gear. Um, we do see the 787, although it's smaller, yeah, it's not the bigger, it's bigger than the 777, it's more expensive. Um, it's uh, in the range of a bit more than $20 million. Um, a 737 um, landing gear, um, for example, um, costs you $3.5 million. And if you look into the very large ones, i380, for example, you are talking about um, $30 million, um, roughly. But obviously, we try to avoid that. We don't want to buy new. So we find hopefully ways to um, arrange with, um, let's say, um, customers to um, maybe um, buy some surplus mark from the market there or some, some additional other solutions. And um, for that matter, there are plenty of landing gears which we have to maintain in the pool. There's one additional figure I can show. Um, for A320, for example, we do maintain about um, uh, 20 uh, landing gears um, to, to provide to our customers. Uh, the graph on the very top right, you see um, the example of a 787. Um, so 
the events on the left hand side they actually state how many um, how many overall events a year will occur and as well on the right hand side you see how many um, landing gears you would require for that. It's a simple math if you put in um, all the time you require um, the overhaul plus um, the shipping removal and installation on the aircraft maybe some spare time you have um, a simple algorithm which is telling you um, in 2027 you need roughly 20 something uh, landing gears and um, each would currently cost 20 million dollars. So coming now a bit more to the market side again um, we have um, currently seen a few trends in 2018, which I want to highlight maybe briefly. Um, one of them actually being the capacity. Um, the past years, in particular in Europe, um, we have seen shops quite, um, well, they have, might have been quite empty. Um, and um, this is something which is and has changed this year. Um, we are seeing um, customers um, coming to us still now to have um, slots and gears overhauled until February. And this is something which um, has picked up in the past, I'd say, probably 18 months quite significantly. And this is not just us, it's the whole environment. We have also um, still quite important, um, and this is key actually for us, we need to have the knowledge about what we do. So about the um, training of our, our employees, we need to have the certain um, amount of, of um, qualification for each step we do. And we need to have a, a quite um, yeah, powerful uh, workforce to, to work on them. So for us, investing into our knowledge and training of our colleagues is quite important. Then we do see in 2018, and this is a surprise for all of us, um, many legacy aircraft still around. Um, actually, on a 747-400, we have basically written that aircraft off already, let's say, two, three, four years ago, uh, saying that, well, don't focus on that, there will not be a lot around anymore, and, um, well, guess what, fuel prices went down and airlines kept these aircrafts. So we have um, seen many, many more coming into um, our shop right now, and this is quite a surprise. So this is also the, one of the reasons why capacity is currently quite limited. Um, the growth um, overall we do see, and um, I have a graph on that in a minute, um, we do see um, the market overall growing quite significantly. So we do see many more airlines, many more aircraft around, and they all require obviously the same thing, um, maintenance. And um, I mentioned this already a couple of times, the investments which we require. Um, next to new technology, so you have seen this before in the two pages there. Um, but what's not happening, and it's quite a surprise because, I mean, everybody in the world is currently about apps and digital data and stuff like that. Um, digital is not very far ahead in our business. It's actually quite slow. And actually you would think this is acting, um, or it's coming more fast, but it's not right now. But this is one thing which is, I think, changing now um, with big data becoming more and more um, crucial and available. Um, what also has changed, and um, this is um, something which we, we are now kind of battling with, uh, our partners and our competitors. Um, by the way, any competitor here? I didn't ask before. <laughs> we have um, obviously um, an established network from um, looking at airlines, but also um, OEMs and MROs, which have been in this area for the past decade. And um, not only this year, but the, the year before as well, um, the airframer, so Boeing and Airbus, are very heavily pushing into the same market. And this is somehow destroying a bit all of our relationships. So um, looking at that, I think it will be quite interesting, and in particular, again, to um, how do we use data to um, understand what the airframer will do with that. Um, and this is also why we believe the um, the left-hand side here, and particularly the airline, does need to own its own data. And then it will be able to make decisions on that, um, on that future overhaul or that um, maintenance. But obviously, an airframer did understand, as well as many investment companies in the world, that you can do a lot of money in uh, maintenance. If you do it right, you can overhaul um, and you can invest in the overall companies. You can, you can do that. So you have seen a lot of companies being bought as well. Um, H&A Group, for example, quite a significant investor in Europe this year, um, have, um, have made some significant investments. 
and partners have been um, yeah, open for that. So what's coming next? Um, well, it's always a good guess, right? Um, but um, looking into what we believe, what we could see, um, obviously still a growth. Um, if you look, uh, well, this is now a very long time scale, but if you look into what has happened um, from um, the financial crisis onwards, deliveries went up again and again and again. So we do see the next years um, a lot of aircraft um, coming into the, um, into the age where they require a particular landing gear overhauls. Um, you can always say it's roughly the 10 years later. Um, and therefore, we do see that there's a lot of growth uh, still. And overall, the world fleet, um, well, as I stated above, will double by 2035. Uh, so um, it's, um, it's a lot of, um, let's say, um, chances in that, in that picture. So coming up next, um, well, we believe um, consolidation will happen. So we will have, um, currently, if you look into um, particular in the landing gear market, you have many companies just focusing on one side. Um, you would have some just in China or just in France or somehow just in the US. So this will not um, stay the same in the future. We will have a consolidation either with joint ventures or partnerships or simply takeovers. And obviously we want to be part of that. So we were going to um, see what kind of partner, what kind of joint venture will be good um, to sustain here as well. Because again, size matters in this business. If you have um, an air framer as your next door neighbor who's pushing for, uh, for your data or for your business. Um, integration is happening as well. So we believe that the business will come and um, will ask for a broader um, perspective on things and maybe a wider perspective on things. So why don't you not just do the overall of a landing gear, but maybe you start from um, uh, replacing it on the, on the wing already. Or why don't you think about um, not replacing it at all. Maybe you can actually fix it um, to last another couple of years. Um, so these things will need to be looked at. Then we're going to see, obviously, um, this is the next wave of new aircraft the new technologies, the new investments which are required. And um, we will see, I mentioned that already, some money required again. So that's also why smaller, um, smaller operators will have to have partners at least. I mean, major legacy carriers will have their own investment and chances. Uh, if you look into um, Emirates, for example, in Dubai, yeah, they don't necessarily need a partner, but um, uh, some additional um, airlines will require that. And as I mentioned before, data analytics um, are quite crucial. So um, random, random example again, if um, you can measure how long it takes a um, landing to deploy during, um, during approach to an aircraft, uh, to an um, airport. So if you measure that figure and if you see it changing, what can you do about it? Is this an indicator already to say, I need to either look into my actuation system or do I need to look into something else? So those things people need to think of now. And this is something which we can collect now. The data are available and um, we can actually make new ideas, new products out of it. That's a bit of what I brought today. Um, I hope um, um, this was interesting for you to, uh, to listen to. Um, actually, if you have any questions, I think that's the time now. Um, and. Uh, Thank you very much for, um, for listening to me. Yeah, hi. Um, there's a lot of talk about data and the need to collect data, but um, who actually owns the data? And isn't it going to be a challenge in terms of making sure it all gets consolidated and who will take the lead on analyzing data, and more importantly, yeah, who owns the data? Mm -hmm. That seems to be the big question. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that's a very good question, and I think the answer is not quite clear yet. Um, we have um, different, let's say, opinions on that, and I think um, also taking the F320 as an example, um, you have these, um, I think, believe, 7,000 data sets every flight. Um, many of them are currently not even accessible to an airline because they're just kept within Airbus. And um, we believe um, these data should at least be owned by the airline. 
because they bought an aircraft. Yeah? Um, and that's currently what we are fighting for. Um, but this is probably not the view an OEM would have or the airframer would have. Um, and then ultimately you can also make these data available if you want to work with them in another environment. For example, this platform we are um, providing um, would give you access to another airline's data as well. So you can actually compare your own maintenance maybe to, I don't know, another airline uh, in, in the same environment. Um, but um, this will be the key question, yes. Um, you mentioned about the capacity, number of landing gears coming through overhaul, and you seem to say that that had increased uh, very sharply over the last year or so. Why, why is that? Mm. Actually, it's the demand for capacity which increased quite heavily. And um, it is simply for the reason that we, on the one side, see older aircraft, legacy aircraft, still in the market. And some of the new ones and uh, deliveries which we have seen are now kicking in as well. So we have an overlap of those two situations which, will, uh, which um, wasn't foreseen and nobody actually invested into that. So we are currently not into, um, in, in a very comfortable situation uh, for many airlines who look into um, slots for next year, for example. Um, currently, I would, um, I would say many of the slots for next year are already gone, uh, within Europe at least. Yeah. Hi. Um, I used to look after 7576 landing gear, mm -hmm. and uh, many years ago it was uh, overhauled on a 10 yearly interval. Um, is that still the same case, or are they run on cycles now? Mm -hmm. um, well, it depends a bit on what aircraft you're looking at. Um, 10 years is still general sample of rule. Um, but, um, for example, on the A320, you could easily reach also the 20,000 cycle limit, um, which is, well, let's say, if you operate uh, five days or five cycles a day, um, you hit this before your 10 years TBO, uh, or the time between overall. Um, but, um, as well, we have um, air framers, or in particular landing gear manufacturers, strive for 12 years um, time as well. So. We expect the 787, for example, and A380 will run on 12 years and not 10 years. Thank you. When you were talking about um, predictive maintenance, you said you could extend the, the maintenance periods of certain mm -hmm. components, so I assume you mean the, the scheduled maintenance. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could just explain what approvals you have, because mm -hmm. I'd, I'd always assume that that um, scheduled maintenance periods would have to come from the OEM, mm -hmm. and that you would be bound by exactly what they say. So do, do you actually have approvals that allow you to extend or adapt their uh, maintenance policies? Yeah. Um, well, in, in a certain way, yeah, the approval is there, but I was thinking more about, um, let's say, aviation behavior, like igniters, for example, are changed at a certain um, threshold. I don't know the threshold right now, but for example, they are ex exchanged quite regularly because um, obviously you don't want to have them fail. Um, you have an AG already. But we have noticed with the data which we have that they still have a life which is about looking at into the uh, typic, uh, typical engine, but it's between 50 to 30% um, of life remaining is left. So you waste, of that igniter, you waste 50% of the life. So if you can just come closer to 80% or 90%, you save a lot of money already within the same environment without any other approval. So as an MRO, then you have to put in technical queries to the OEM, do you, each time? Well, or, or do you have an approval that allows you to Well, the, the to approvals we have would allow us to develop own repairs and own um, uh, um, maintenance as well. Um, then this is depending on the airline, accepting it or not. Um, and this is basically yeah, up, to, up to the lesser, usually. Thank you. Listening to those questions um, and thinking about structural health monitoring in, in say, an airframe component, <clears throat> you, you, the ownership is, is, is something, if you're capturing the data in your flights, it's your data. Mm -hmm. The airframer has invested in putting the system in the aircraft. He thinks it's his data. Mm -hmm. Looking at maintenance credits as we just heard in the previous question, if you own 
your flights, you own your landing gear, it must be your opportunity to apply those maintenance credits to, to, to your undercarriages to gain a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. There's just so much, so many variables, so many owners of the data. Mm -hmm. Where does it currently sit? I know where it sits in structural health monitoring in, in airframe mm -hmm. structures. Mm -hmm. Where does it currently sit in, in a heavy mechanical component like a landing gear? Um, I think first of all, many of the data are currently not even collected. So you would uh, be astonished how many telexes are not read. And I mean, they're just there, but not really analyzed. Um, so accessing that and actually gaining more and more knowledge about that is the first step to actually get there. And uh, we can easily do this with the airline fleet we have as our, um, in our group. So um, there are more and more data coming available every week. Um, but then actually your question is that, um, or the answer to your question is still it's not 100% clear. We are currently fighting with the airframers and may end up in a legal fight um, that um, we believe an airline should have the ownership of that. Yeah. So this is the, the true belief and we don't even claim we as MRO should have it. Yeah? it should have, the airline should have full ownership of data. It's like RCM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you use the aeroplane, yep. where you use the landing gear. Yep. It's specific to you. It isn't generic mm -hmm. to the aeroplane. It's specific to your exactly. operation. Yep. I guess there's, there's an element of that in as well. Yeah, exactly. And there are highly paid uh, lawyers and legal counsels who actually fight about that right now. We also approached the European Union and the European Commission to re uh, have a regulation um, set up for that. Um, it's, not, um, it's not so clear, unfortunately, yet. Hello there, yes. Um, with the undercarriages, which environment is the harshest? The s sun, dust and sand versus the ice and snow environment, cold ice and snow. Sun, dust and sand versus cold ice and snow. Which takes it out most on the yeah. undercarriage? Um, I mean, corrosion is the most things which we see on a landing gear um, currently. Um, and you would I think this is coming from mostly um, an environment which is rather cold and wet and windy and all that stuff. Um, but then, actually, we don't see a lot of differences at all um, between different airlines on the landing gear. Um, I mean, you have certain rework you do on certain, uh, on certain aircraft types rather than actually differences between aircraft um, operating, let's say, in Japan or in uh, Dubai, for example. Different than engine, for example. Engine, you would see totally different patterns. Um, but the landing gear is quite, quite stable, solid, and you wouldn't see, or you couldn't tell if it's operated in India or in, in, in uh, UK. Yeah. And also, with the, could, it, more than the now extensive use of carbon reinforced plastics, have you, are you aware of any, let me say, interesting incidents with using this material? Because this is still relatively new. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally am not aware, no, can't, uh, can't comment on that. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I mean, currently, I think the whole aerospace industry is having a hard time finding new talent. So, um, with the growth of the whole industry mm -hmm. and how many aircrafts are coming into the market by 2035, how is Lufthansa Technik taking the you know, the challenge with the new generation? Mm -hmm. Well, good question. Actually, not the HR expert, but uh, let me try to answer still. Um, well, obviously, um, we try to engage very early um, with potential candidates during university or, for example, also, we do have our own apprentices, which, uh, which we have on board. So we invest a lot into education and we also, um, not just, let's say, take for granted that people will just come because we have a brand name there, yeah? So um, this, is, this is one thing which, in particular, also in the UK we are doing. So we have, um, we have um, I think currently, this year we just have had 10 apprentices, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
so it's compared to the size of the company, um, it's, it's uh, hopefully um, a significant figure. But uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, yes, and in particular um, um, having also this challenge not just in the UK but also in Germany in particular. Um, we um, we try to invest also in the, the people which are still already in the in the group. So you have chances to develop um, your career within different um, um, fields. Um, I mean, personally, I did start in Hamburg, moved to Florida, now I'm in the UK. So you have chances which hopefully will um, keep you with the company and um, yeah, foster talents basically is, is one of the ideas and chances for that. So if you're asking specific, um, I forgot to mention that, we are currently looking for a senior project engineer. So if uh, anybody is interested, give me, give me a hint. I'll have some business cards here um, and uh, maybe we can uh, speak about that later. Asked you a question earlier, I'll, I'll ask you because everyone else yep. might be interested. <coughs> that horrible word, Brexit. Your demographic, <laughs> I presume, is like most aerospace companies. It's broad, there are people from all over the world who are qualified. Yep. Yep. How will Brexit hit your business down the road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we, we spoke about that a bit, yeah. Um, maybe let me start with that. We actually, as a company, usually don't have political statements and we don't usually go out in the field and say, you should vote this and that. Before Brexit, we actually made, um, or we, we wrote a letter to all our employees and said, this will gonna hurt us. And this is not what we like and what we're gonna or like to see. Um, well, unfortunately, the result is it is, um, and uh, we have to respect that. But um, eventually, there will be um, a certain damage um, to the business, and it's it's coming either from again um, having qualified people around. We are very diverse in um, in, in our um, yeah in our workforce right now. In particular, let's say looking if, if I look at my team, I have um, obviously people from around the UK. But uh, there are Italians, Lithuanians, we have uh, Singapore Chinese in there. Um, so we have all kind of different um, culture and we like that and we enjoy that very much. Um, customers are concerned, so they're actually quite worried about what's happening um, with my landing gear if I send it to the UK. Does it actually cross the border? Um, is this more complicated? Does it cost me more? Um, these are the things which we listen to from our customers. We are in the fortunate position that I mean, standard which we have to supply and certification to our landing gears all around the world. Everybody wants to see an FAA and an ESR certification. And so this is standard. Even if you do this in India, you need to have those two certificates. Um, we are fortunate enough that we are currently um, under a group approval of um, authority, so we are actually certifying according to the German um, authority approval, um, Luftfahrt Bundesamt, and this will remain even in Brexit that we have EASA certification as well available. Um, but then we think about increasing stock levels because we don't know if parts will move that freely and that easily, and we, we have to we have to send 80% of our business across um, to any other state or nation, um, it's, so therefore it is significant for us, yeah. From across the globe, from the center of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading from the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you enjoyed this content, please consider showing your support for the Society. Share a link to this presentation by email or on your favorite social networks. If you have an interest in aerospace, consider the professional and personal benefits of membership. Visit www.aerosociety.com.